and thank you for being with us tonight for the East Bay Regional Park District Ward 1 Director Candidate Forum. My name is Madeline Cronenberg. I'm from the League of Women Voters of West Contra Costa County. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. We do not support or oppose candidates or parties. The advocacy arm of the League may take positions on issues such as ballot measures. The League, uh, however, the forum, this forum is presented by the Voter Services and Education arm of the League, which does not take positions or advocate for them. I'd like to remind everyone that the candidates have all agreed to participate under ground rules that are set for this forum. These ground rules are the same as those that are set for other forums just posted in Eventbrite. The candidates are not permitted to display campaign buttons, t-shirts, signs, Zoom backgrounds, et cetera, in order to maintain neutrality. We are recording tonight's forum and the session will be available on our website, lwvbae.org and through votersedge.org backslash CA with links to our social media accounts at LWVBAE. There are two candidates running for East Bay Regional Park District Ward 1 Director. They are Norman LaForte and Elizabeth Eccles. On your ballot, you will be able to choose one candidate out of the two. Now we'll go over the ground rules. Each candidate has two minutes for opening remarks the order was determined by drawing lots. The timekeeper will signal the candidates with a green colored window, which will count down the seconds from two minutes to 15 seconds to go, when it will turn yellow and then red when the full two minutes are up. As, as people signed up via Zoom, they submitted written questions. If you have additional questions, you may click the Q&A icon, type them in and hit submit. Our volunteers will take the questions and pass them to me. All questions will be screened to avoid duplication and personal attacks. The order of answering the questions will be alternated and each candidate will have one minute to respond to each question. Again, the timekeeper will signal the candidates. There will be no separate rebuttals. However, the candidates may choose to use some or all of their one minute to rebut the response given by another candidate. Following the questions, each candidate shall have one minute for a closing state. Now we'll begin our forum with the uh, first candidate to give an opening statement of two minutes. And our first candidate is Mr. LaForce. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here tonight and to uh, do this forum. I'm running as a proven leader with a record of accomplishment on parks and open space. I have over 35 years as a CR Club leader of bringing people together, working collaboratively and in coalition to help create parks and to make uh, uh, playing grounds and to find the money to get our parks uh, managed and operated and uh, created. Uh, I was one of the key architects of putting together the coalition that got us the McLaughlin East Shore State Park, stopped the high rise development on the Berkeley shoreline and also stopped the uh, development of the uh, massive uh, shopping center at the Albany, uh, Albany Beach area. Uh, I was critical in getting the, putting together the, uh, the deal that made the Tom Bates sports fields possible and moving them to a location where we actually doubled the number of sports fields. I'm endorsed by the Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters, uh, people like Keith Carson, Jesse Erigwin, Mayor Berkeley, Kate Harrison, Sophie Hahn of the Berkeley City Council, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Bates. I'm also endorsed by the mayor of, of Albany, the mayors and the city council members of, um, of El Cerrito, Gail McLaughlin uh, and the team Richmond in Richmond, the Richmond Progressive Alliance uh, and the Green Parties of Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Uh, I have a record of bringing people together to make parks happen, which is I think why the park district in the past has asked me specifically, me, to chair their campaigns for their various tax measures, AAWWCCFF. Uh, I make parks happen. Uh, you can learn more about me by going to my website, laforceofcourse.org.
Eccles. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Eccles, and thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. As your representative on the East Bay Regional Park District Board, I listen to the needs of our communities. I'm deeply committed to preserving the natural and cultural heritage of our parks and providing open space, trails, and recreational opportunities for our diverse community. My commitment to the parks dates back to childhood when I served as a junior ranger in Tilden. Since that time, I've dedicated my life to public service with leadership positions in environmental policy, parks, and recreation. From serving in the Obama administration to implementing environmental policies as head of our state's public advocate's office, I have the experience to be an effective steward for our parks and ensure that the park district is working for you. I bring extensive public policy experience on environmental protection, climate change, and wildfire prevention and mitigation. I also bring years of board and management level experience. When I served as a member of the Obama Biden transition team, I was responsible for strategic planning, policy, and staffing recommendations at the highest level. In my current role as director of the state's public advocate's office, I manage a budget of $47 million and about 180 staff. And at the local level, I chaired the city of Berkeley's Children, Youth and Recreation Commission. My priorities include preserve and expand our parkland for all to enjoy, plan for current and future climate impacts, especially wildfire mitigation and sea level rise, increase opportunities to connect underserved communities with East Bay parks, especially youth, and develop and retain a park district workforce at all levels that reflects the full diversity of our community. I'm proud to be endorsed by community leaders like Congressman Mark DeSalne, State Superintendent Tony Thurman, Senator Nancy Skinner, Assemblymember Buffy Wicks, the mayors and former mayors of every single city in my district, and all of my colleagues on the East Bay Parks Board. I hope to earn your support as well. Thank you. Start with uh, Ms. Eccles and then Mr. LaForce. Uh, first question, what specific steps are available to the park district for its short-term and long-term management to mitigate the threats of the climate crisis? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the climate crisis is real, that's obvious. We have uh, the, the biggest things that are impacting the park is the, the obviously the fire risk as well as the uh, sea level rise. We have 55 miles of shoreline that we need to protect and shore up. So that is one of the things that we're doing on the shoreline. We're using adapted restoration. That's what we did at Albany Beach when we restored that area. Um, in terms of fires, uh, we are yearly going out and treating those high risk areas between the you know the, the park interface and the urban interface and all the way from Richmond, the Richmond East Bay Hills, all the way down to Castro Valley every single year. We've We've doubled our firefighters, number of firefighters in the last 18 months. We've, we're going out and getting more grants from FEMA and the state. And so, th and, and, and uh, Measure FF also provides for money, which we will plan to match. Um, so these are some of the things that we're doing to, to combat the impacts of climate change. Thank you. Same question, Mr. LaForte. Would you like me to repeat it? Well, first off, um, one of the long-term threats is uh, fire. And actually, I was one of the people who put together the coalition that got the park district to actually do a vegetation management plan that Ms. Eccles now talks about. That didn't exist. And for years, the park district refused to do that. We finally got it put together. And uh, we also, the park district needed money for that. And that money came out of the park district measure double C, which I was the co-chair of specifically for fire the plan and doing the implementation work. And Measure Double F, which I also co-chaired, included money at my request for doubling, for including extra firefighters. So in terms of fire, I've been there. I've been doing this for the past 30 years with the park district. In terms of sea level rise, the, the park district needs to take a regional approach. It takes a piecemeal approach right now. It needs to be the regional agency that leads on this because of all the shoreline it has. 
And I've been advocating for that. And again, the park district is reluctant to do that. So when, if I get elected, I'm gonna be pushing the park district, park district to be a regional leader. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll start with Mr. LaForce. What are the most important issues specifically facing Ward 1 and how will you address them? The, uh, the specific issues are uh, increasing park areas. In fact, one of the big issues is how to save Point Malati. And actually, I've been involved with that for 20 years. I'm currently an attorney in, in lawsuits trying to stop what's going to be a luxury housing development where you would have to have $250,000 a year to live there. And instead, we want to save the sacred uh, Ohlone sites that are there. Also, the uh, make the Chinese shrimp camp a national historic on the National Historic Register and to create parks and open space because in Richmond, they desperately need ball fields for the youth and kids of Richmond. And we could do that at Point Malati. We also need to improve the fire risk it's clear after two years uh, with fires uh, that the plan that's been adopted 15 years ago needs to be updated. And again, the park district is refusing to do that. It says it costs too much. Well, a big fire is gonna cost a lot more. So we need to get the fire risk under control and more and better planning, evaluating what's changed now in the environment due to climate change. Thank you. Ms. Echol? One of the issues that's particularly important for our district is to create more, more urban parks and um, to really provide more access to our underserved communities and in particular our underserved youth. So I'll address both of those points. One of my priorities is to continue to expand parkland, um, particularly along the North Richmond sh shoreline and continue to convert uh, industrial land to parkland. Um, I, I also feel strongly that we need to preserve um, Point Malate and, and have that access to people that's, a, a, you know, the park district has wanted to have a park there ever since the naval base closed down back in 1995. And we've certainly submitted comments on that in the process. Um, but I also want to address specifically on, on opportunities for our underserved youth, because as I talk to people in the community, this is one of the things that keeps coming up. And so some of the ideas that I have in terms of expanding opportunities for our youth by providing more scholarships for camp and other recreational opportunities, as well as increasing opportunities for youth jobs. And the East Bay Parks is already the biggest employer of youth, but there are opportunities to do more and to get more of our underserved communities into those opportunities. And this is something that we've also been talking with uh, Congressman Barbara Lee about in terms of- Thank you. <laughs> All right. And now we're gonna start the next question with you, Ms. Eccles. Um, what is the status of the Park District budget? And what are the current priorities this budget supports? And if you disagree, what would be your priorities? So, our, the park district, uh, fortunately, is in reasonably good shape, even though uh, obviously we have had some loss of income because of COVID. Um, but the park district, because 90% of our general fund is dependent on taxes from property tax, um, that projected stream of income is pretty strong still. The What, what our consultants say is that the, um, the increase in property rates will go down, um, but it will still continue to increase. Uh, so our budget is not going to drop in the in the near future. So in terms of priorities, uh, you know, the priorities in terms of what should be funded match my priorities for what, what what some of the priorities that I listed in my opening, which includes um, land acquisition, which includes more opportunities for our underserved communities, um, as well as uh, other recreational opportunities. And um, one of the other things I, I wanna do, which actually doesn't cost any money, is expand our um, environmental education. And that's something that I've been talking with uh, Superintendent Tony Thurman about. Thank you. Um, Mr. LaForce. Well, first off, the budget is really two components. One is the budget for acquisition of parkland. That comes out of Measure Double W, who I chaired and helped get to double the size of the park district. And what we need there is actually a lot more money 
we have to find ways to find that money because we need to increase our parklands. We need to have more uh, habitat areas and we also need to have actually more off-leash dog areas and, uh, and recreational areas. And that can only be done through uh, tax measures that give us the money to acquire parkland. The other component is the operations. And there uh, we also need to have more money because one of the critical priorities for me is opening up all the land banked property that the park district has that is not open to the public. And we need to find ways to fund that because those, those parklands remain unopened. The last point is to increase the opportunities for youth, just as I did with creating the Tom Bates sports fields for uh, youth in, in the area of Richmond through uh, Emeryville and Berkeley and Albany and El Cerrito. So those are the three top priorities. Thank you. Uh, this Next question goes to you first, Mr. LaFort. What are your views on balancing the needs for preserving natural resources and developing new opportunities for outdoor recreation? Okay, oh, okay. So there always has to be a balance and you have to base that balance on what the values are for the particular property you're looking at and also doing scientific analysis of what are the important impacts and needs uh, in that particular area and property. So for example, if you have a property that has uh, important cultural sites like Round Valley, Native American sites, or habitat like a Sibley Nature Preserve, then you have to say, well, wait a minute, we, we can't open that up to the amount of recreation we would have like at the Tom Bates sports fields, uh, or what we're proposing or try, I'm trying to do at the Point, uh, Point Milwaukee. So there, it really needs to be science-based, just like climate change is science-based. We need to have good analysis and that requires the staffing to do that. And again, that goes back to the operational budget that needs to be increased because the staffing is not there to do that kind of uh, careful analysis that needs to be done. And we just, we just need to find a balance and identify the properties that are best for recreation and those that are best for habitat and wildlife protection. Thank you, Ms. Eccles. Unmute. Sorry, I had some trouble getting unmuted there. Um, I, I believe that parks are for everyone and we need to find ways to provide recreational opportunities for everyone. You know, I grew up in the parks hiking, biking, canoeing, camping, and still very respectful of, of the environment. And so I think it's important to bring people in and at the same time protect sensitive areas. So I support the work of the Trail User Working Group, which is convened to talk to various user groups and discuss which trails should be used for which purposes and try to reach some consensus. This is an area where I have a particular strength of bringing people together and you know, finding, you know, finding the, the most creative solutions to uh, achieving the goals of various divergent views. Um, I also think it's important where there are sensitive areas that Obviously, we need to protect those sensitive areas. So it is a balancing act, but I think that, that it can be maximized by providing recreational opportunities where it's appropriate and, and providing uh, protection for sensitive areas where, where that's appropriate. Thank you. And you get the next question. Regarding the district's master plan, where do you see the district in 20 years? with respect to emphasizing acquiring more land versus managing and stewarding what we have now? Well, it has to be some of both, but I think when push comes to shove, we have to acquire the land. If land becomes available through whatever process, we need to buy that land because otherwise it could be gone forever. So I think that, you know, if there's limited funds and we're choosing between, between acquiring and, and managing, then you know, we have to do some of both. And so I think part of that is really continuing to, um, to have a great brand that people are willing to support. You know, people 
have been incredibly generous with the parks because they love the parks. We, we pull off the charts in terms of, of uh, access and the ability to use them. And so, you know, we rely on the, the goodwill of the taxpayers to continue to, to fund the, the acquisitions. And so we, you know, we, we need to do that, but we also make, need to be able to open and, and uh, provide access to the parks as well. Thank you. And Mr. LaForce. Well, we need to expand the parks. I would love to see in 20 years a doubling yet again of the park district's uh, ownership of property and parks, not only for preservation of habitat, but also for greater uh, recreational purposes and accessibility, particularly in the urban areas, which what I've been working on for just only about 35 years. Um, the issue there is we need to find creative sources to, to uh, fund uh, not only the acquisition, but also how to open up those park areas once we get them. The park district also needs to be uh, much more uh, innovative and willing to, to take chances and willing to go out there. Uh, one of the saddest things about the park district is that years and years ago, uh, it, had a, it had a chance to buy Point Melati for $1, 270 acres for $1, and it turned it down. And now we're in a huge fight to stop a luxury housing development out there when the park district had it had a leap of faith and went and, and did what sh it should have done, we could have had Point Milwaukee now as a great park with lots of ball fields for the kids in Richmond. Thank you. Um, all right, we're done with that question. New question to Mr. LaForce. What can be done to address the impact of climate change with regard to vegetation management? Well, what needs to be done is the vegetation plan that was that I helped put together 15 years ago needs to be updated and reevaluated given uh, what's clearly massive changes that have occurred uh, from climate change in just the last two years with the huge fires we've had. We have to have a real analysis of how we can better protect and handle vegetation management. And in particular, how to deal with the, the risk from the uh, highly explosive and fire dangerous blue gum eucalyptus trees. Um, up in uh, Kensington, I've just talked with people there. They're very upset the park district is not responding to them. And their own fire chief has pointed out that if there was a huge fire that started in Tilden, people in Kensington would have eight minutes to, uh, to escape. So we need to really reevaluate this plan. It's, it's unfortunately out of date after just 15 years of having been created. And again, the park district is refusing to do this. They say, oh no, we don't, it's gonna cost us too much. And as I said, the cost of a huge fire like in 1991 in Oakland is gonna dwarf any kind of cost for the park district to update its plan given what's happened with climate change. Thank you. Ms. Echols. Well, so first of all, I need to correct uh, something that Mr. LaForce just said about the park district having an opportunity to buy that land. That's actually not accurate. The city of Richmond had the opportunity to buy the land for a dollar and it was part of a, a negotiation that the park district brokered, um, but it wasn't offered to the park district. It was uh, offered to the city of Richmond and the city council voted it down. And, you know, we, we are, are very sad about that. Uh, we would have loved to have had an opportunity to develop that land as a park, as a big regional park. Um, and hopefully we still will have that opportunity. Um, in terms of the, the, yes, of course, you know, fires have a horrendous impact on, on the climate. The, you know, these fires have pretty much wiped out all of the work that I've been doing in my, in my other job in terms of, of reducing greenhouse gases by implementing the state's climate change policies. Um, so there, there's a lot more work to be done. You know, the park district is, as we speak, going out and getting more grants from, from FEMA and from Cal OES, Operations of Emergency Services, to do that work. Um, it, and it is my highest priority to make the parks safe for our neighbors, for our, our workers, and for our, our um, visitors. And um, Thank so, you. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Next question that goes to you, Ms. Eccles. What specific steps should be taken to counter continuing sea level rise, which threatens I-80 and areas east of the East Bay Regional Parks, including McLaughlin, East Shore, State Park. 
Yeah, so it, it really depends on the specific area. The work that we're doing now, as I mentioned very briefly earlier, the adaptive restoration work can include um, building out marshland uh, where, where we can do that and where that can help to absorb some of the sea level rise. In other places, we have to build what's more, um, almost more like a levee, but you know we prefer doing the marshes. Um, and so uh, it, it really is, uh, Geogra geographically specific in terms of how best to address the sea level rise, um, but that is something that we're, as I said earlier, very focused on giving, given the 55 miles of shoreline that we, that we manage. Thank you. Mr. LaForte. Sure. Well, first, I really have to correct Ms. Eccles. I was there, this was back in 1995, trying to save Point Milwaukee, and I'm sorry, the park district had the opportunity to buy those acres, the 270 acres for a dollar, and it did not. Uh, and that's a real shame. Um, what we need to do with resilient shorelines is we need to have a regional approach. There needs to be a regional agency. There needs to be uh, a focus on how we do this collectively. Uh, and that's where the park district could step up to the plate and take initiative, which it has failed to do, and be proactive. They just got done with a plan for Hayward and uh, trying to protect the Hayward shoreline. And when they were asked, uh, well, what's going to happen south at Union City? The response was, well, that's Union City's problem, not ours. Uh, and similarly, north with San Leandro. Well, that's San Leandro's problem, not ours. Well, you could do all you want in one piecemeal location, but the water's going to go around on either side. So the park district really needs to step up the plate and take a proactive approach, which it has not done. And I will make it do that. Okay, well, this is sort of a follow-up question to your answer just now. Do you support the idea of a regional vegetation management plan? And if so, what specific steps would you take as a director to make it happen? Well, actually, I've been trying to do that, working on that for uh, close to about maybe uh, nine months now. Uh, when it wasn't fashionable to talk about it, a number of us got together, again, building coalitions to put together a regional uh, agency to deal with this issue. And, this, and the fact is that that agency, the best, first, the best en entity to handle that is the park district because, because of the uh, vegetation management plan I got them to do, they actually have the best expertise and knowledge about it. And because they have the funding through measure double F, they have funding for at least partially doing vegetation management work. Uh, but for example, the city of Oakland is woefully way behind, and we need to put together a, a, a joint powers agency that will take, uh, take on this issue in a collective way, collaboratively, and will do this uh, to help reduce the fire risk. And I've been, I've been working on this for a long time now, and I will continue to work on it if elected as the park director. Thank you. Ms. Eccles. So we, we do work very, very closely with the cities and counties throughout the, the district. In fact, we work with people even north of here. So, um, so, you know, whether you have a formal JPA put in place or whether you're working closely with people, I think the, the really important thing is that people are focused on getting the job done. And the grants that we currently have in place and then the additional grants that we're bringing in, these are, these are designated for specific for specific things and our the plan that we have is based on years of science and it was vetted and objective and so we continue to implement this plan every single year to get it done now that's not to say that there's not more that could be done but but that you know that is what we're working on and that's what we're getting the money for and we are working with the local cities and counties and we're particularly working with the city and counties on stopping fire uh, so when you know when there's any uh, very often we're the very first people on the on the call before uh, the city or county or other fire service gets there and in fact we've even got people fighting fires up in the north bay right now thank you um, and again to Ms. Eccles, how will you increase outreach to low income communities and people of color to address the equity issues in park usage and to increase diversity in district employment? 
Yeah, well, so first of all, I'll take the, the last part of that question first. I, I work very closely with the, uh, the AFSCME 2428 Diversity Committee to um, pass a resolution at the board level to make specific changes at the park district to address systemic racism at the park district. And so that, that resolution includes specific steps like um, hiring an EEO officer, like uh, removing barriers to um, recruitment and um, promotions and to, so that everybody can achieve their very highest level. And so some of those, some of those um, barriers to recruitment, for example, is, you know, where you can find people. And this specifically says, okay, we need to, we need to go where the, the people are, right? We need to go to, to the churches, to the, to the historically black universities and other places to recruit those folks. In terms of outreach, um, it, aside from employment, I, this is a huge priority of mine to, to not try to make up what it is that, that people want, but to go out and meet with the community groups, meet with um, the, and, and I've got support from uh, Bay, Bay Action Rising and other groups that want to work with me on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eccles. And same question, Mr. LaForce. Yeah, well, I have to say first that uh, unfortunately the Park District has not been handling vegetation management in terms of the risk up there from the latest uh, involve, involvement with uh, the people using fireworks. I, I've just talked with people in Kensington who were very upset that when they called the Park District about it, the, the response of the fire chief and police chief was, that's, that's not our concern. You call, you call Oakland, talk to them. Uh, which is not a re not a response. If you had a joint uh, responsible regional agency, you wouldn't have that. Um, in terms of accessibility for uh, the uh, underserved communities, that's what I've been working on for the past 30 years. We need to do more of that. We need to have, uh, and I actually set forth a 12-step program that I sent over to the Park District long before any resolution on this was put to the board in June. And a lot of that said, we need you need to go out in the community and talk to people. You need to set up community meetings. That's not yet been done. Nothing has been done. And it's very simple. The Park District has a headquarters up way far away from most areas that it's not accessible by uh, BART or bus. They need to have meetings in the communities. They need to set up Zoom meetings on all the communities and not just have people try to come to them. That's what- Thank you. Thank you. Next question goes to Mr. LaForce. Uh, this is a topic you've alluded to. What do you see as the current role of the district with respect to Point Milwaukee? Well, the role of the park district is to advocate for a, as great a park as possible and to join with the environmental community, with the Native American community, with the indigenous people, with the Chinese community, uh, with the African American community, and actually come out and say, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna accept a luxury housing development where you need $250,000 a year to live there. And that's what needs to be done. They need to be upfront, out there, active on this issue with the environmental community and, and the people of Richmond who want this. Uh, unfortunately, Mayor Tom Butt is, this is his vanity project and he's endorsed Ms. Eccles. Um, and I think that compromises the park district and its ability to handle this issue uh, because uh, Tom Butt is extremely powerful in Richmond. We need to take take on this this crazy development that uh, is not good for anybody and certainly not good for the people of Richmond. Thank you, thank you, and Ms. Eccles. Well, first of all, I'm I'm endorsed by a lot of people. As I said earlier, I'm endorsed by by mayors and former mayors and city council members in every single city in the district. So I don't think we can say just because I'm endorsed by one person it means I'm going to act any kind of way, but um, so, but, but in terms of, of our role, um, as I said, we have been involved in, in conversations and in, um, and, and we did participate in the, in the planning process and we did make our views clear that, that we did not believe that the plan on the table provided for the type of regional park that we envision having there. We also made clear in our comments that the development poses a major fire safety hazard. Um, so I hope that there will be an opportunity to work with the community, to work with the city of Richmond, and to work with everyone else and, and actually create a park that, that all of us want to see there. Thank you. Um, 
and now the next question goes to Ms. Eccles. Would you support the development and operation of dedicated trails and facilities for off-road cycling in East Bay Park? And if so, how? Okay, so as I said earlier, parks need to be for everyone. Um, and I support the process that's in place now of bringing all the user groups to the table to talk about what makes the most sense. Clearly, the, um, the demand for mountain biking has not kept up with the trails, um, but at the same time, we, we need to we really need to take a holistic approach and say, okay, so where is it appropriate to have more trails and, and where isn't it? And to work together with all of the, the stakeholders who use the park to, to find the best, the best places for additional trails. Thank you. And Mr. LaForte. Yeah, I certainly support um, expanding opportunities for uh, bicycles, mountain bikes, et cetera, uh, in our parks. and. Uh, the Trails Workshop. In fact, the Trails Workshop was something I advocated two years ago for the Park District to create. And again, it took two years of trying to make this happen that we finally got it, even though I called on that two years ago. I also called upon the Park District to have a huge, to have a in inclusive process where all groups could be present and not just a select few people making this decision because you have to have a buy-in uh, from everybody. So this means all, all kinds of hiking groups, equestrian groups, mountain bike groups, all the people need to be there to, to work on this in a facilitative process. And that's still not happened. The board has not given direction to do that. We, we still have to get many more groups, including mountain bike groups and other groups uh, onto this process. It needs to be as big as possible so we have an inclusive process where people have buy-in at the end of the day and a consensus that we work on. Thank you. And Mr. LaForce, you go first now. In this time of distance learning for our local children, how can the district coordinate their digital resources with teachers and families? Okay. Well, they need to do that with the, with the staff uh, staffing that will uh, handle that and work in the schools with people, uh, with the teachers and the, um, and the principals uh, to make that happen. Uh, I don't think that's happened as much as it can and should. Um, and the Park District needs to find dedicated funding for that uh, to make that happen, particularly in areas of underserved communities. So for example, uh, when I helped get uh, preserved, Martin Luther King preserved, one of the components of that was getting money so that so the Oakland youth, particularly in West Oakland, could actually go down there and experience the wildlife and, and the Martian there. Uh, that now needs to be done in a way that they, through virtual learning that they can do uh, with also as much as possible trying to get them actually out there because, you know, being out there in the, in the woods and the marshland is, is, is much better than looking at it on a, on a screen, but hopefully we can we can find ways to do that, and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. And Ms. Eccles. Well, environmental education and expanding environmental education is one of the things that I'm, I'm very passionate about. And when COVID first hit, I thought, oh no, <laughs> what are we going to do now? I, we're not going to be able to do this environmental education, at least in terms of school visits and, and people coming and, and meeting with our naturalists and learning about the natural world. But, but fortunately, we have amazingly creative naturalists and other staff who took the opportunity to develop online curriculum during this time. So now we have just this vast uh, array of curriculum that meets the state's science curriculum that, that we can use all over California and in, in, uh, in other states. And it, you know, it's fabulous. You should, you should check it out. I've shared it with, um, with state superintendent, superintendent, excuse me, state superintendent Tony Thurman and his staff, and they're, they're very excited about it. There's great opportunities to use uh, this online curriculum that tells a wonderful story about the natural world um, and, and in a lively, engaging way for kids um, to use that in the classroom for free. So that's Thank up there. You. It's available it's on our website. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Eckel. Uh, you go first on this next question. Uh, what is the current wildfire risk 
in the various East Bay Regional Parks of Ward 1? And how are you addressing that risk? Yeah, well, as you probably know, with the uh, with the high high fire, I mean, sorry, the high winds that are going on right now and the dryness in the air, we have we have shut a number of the parks in in Ward One, including Tilden and Wildcat Canyon, because it is at the very highest level of of fire risk right now, and so uh, that means that that we're ask people to stay out of the parks where staff is for the most part not working in those parks um, but and our our fire patrols are on heightened alert and paying close attention to any signs of of uh, fire or other danger in the parks and and on that matter i actually want to correct something that that mr lafour said earlier because this issue about the fireworks and people throwing stuff off grizzly peak I heard about that over the weekend. I called our, our chief of public safety. He was on it by Monday morning. He had already talked to the chiefs of, of City of Berkeley, City of Oakland, and, and uh, uh, UC Berkeley, and all of them got together within a few days to, to figure out what to do about it. And they've taken concrete steps by putting logs on the turnouts up on Grizzly Peak to prevent that kind of activity going forward. Thank you, Ms. Eccles. And now Mr. LaForce. Well, the fire risk is very high and it's very high because the park district still only does thinning of eucalyptus in many of these areas. They really need to do an engagement, a phased effort to, phased work to remove the blue gum eucalyptus, which is a gasoline tree that explodes with heat. Uh, particularly up at Tilden, as I said, uh, the Kensington fire chief uh, said if, that, if a fire starts up there with the kinds of winds we had in 1991, uh, people in Kensington and frankly El Cerrito and Richmond Hills probably only have a few minutes to escape. So there needs to be a whole better approach to how we're dealing with that. Um, and that's what's critical here, particularly Oakland. Oakland still does not have a good fire program put together. It still doesn't have the appropriate funding. So it's a high risk area too. And I have to disagree with Ms. Eccles, I'm sorry to say, but I, I just talked with people in Kensington today. And what happened was uh, the, the roadway, the Grizzly Peak is actually owned and controlled by uh, the city of Oakland. And when people called and asked the park district police to do something about it, the response was, that's not our street. We don't deal with that, call Oakland. And that's just not an acceptable solution. Thank you. Um, the next question goes to you, Mr. LaForce. How would you answer voters who have concerns about the wisest use of tax revenues raised through ballot measures? Well, the way we've actually done that in all the ballot measures of which I've been a co-chair, that's measure AA, measure WW, measure K, measure CC, measure FF, is that in each of those occasions, the park district had, has a, a oversight committee that reviews that it's civilian or a, 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 a public oversight committee that reviews that. Uh, so that's one way. And that, that comes from my experience on the uh, El Cerrito City Council uh, on I'm an elected official. I've been through budget, I've been through budget cuts. I know what it's like, and I know how people feel about where money's going. And I've been there and done that. Uh, the other way is the park district does have external audits uh, done by reputable auditing uh, agencies, uh, companies. And so far, the park district has a pretty good record on that. So that um, it, it has two kinds of controls: an outside audit, and also a, a, a watchdog uh, group inside. Uh, you know. The park district made up of, of people in the park, park board, not park board, but the uh, civilians of the park that, that handle that. Thank you. And Ms. Echo. Well, in addition to the transparency and auditing, which is absolutely critical to any public process, the bottom line is the park district delivers on our promises. And so with every single one of these measures, the various cities get to put in what, how they see, want to see money spent and we deliver on that. And so this, when we go out for it to the public for a tax measure, it's not like, oh, give us more money. It's like, please give us more money so we can do all of these following things. And I think that that makes a difference for people who want accountability and want to see their tax uh, 
dollars spent wisely. The, the other way that we can reassure people is that, is that by delivering on our promises and continuing to offer a really great experience for people in our parks, people want to, want to invest in our parks. And we've done very well with our, our tax measures for that reason. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Eccles, we'll start with you. How does Ward 1 compare to the other wards with respect to the level of investment? Assuming there are some disparities, how do you propose to see a geographic equitable level of investment in Ward 1? Yeah, so in, at the, in the park district, we look at the park holistically and then each, each director sets out their priorities. And my priorities have been uh, a park at Point Malate and continuing to convert industrial land on the North Richmond uh, shoreline to park land. And so, you know, the, the money that's in, in any particular district at any time, it does fluctuate. Um, but I know that I have the support of my board members to, to really do some good work in, in my district. And, and I fully intend to uh, use that, that, that support and goodwill. Thank you, Ms. Eccles. Mr. LaForte. Well, uh, there's, again, you have to divide this up between the money for acquisition and the money for operations. In acquisition, the Park District, again, I've worked on these measures, AA and WW, set aside money for each of the various areas of the Park District in an equitable fashion based on population and other factors and then money is put into the different areas. And that's how you make sure there's an equitable distribution. The problem is for those areas, however, there's issues related to Eastern Alameda and Contra Costa counties that make that a little difficult to do. But nevertheless, that's how it's done. With regard to operations, again, there was an attempt with Measure K to do that. Uh, I co-chaired that campaign, that campaign lost, unfortunately, uh, because of Eastern Alameda and Contra Costa counties not voting for it. So what I proposed with a number of other people was to create a separate tax district that became Measure Double C, which provides funding for the parks in the area that covers Measure Double C and its extension, Measure Double F. And while that means more money goes to us, that's because we're willing to tax ourselves to do it, while other portions of the park district have not shown that willingness to be taxed. Thank you, Mr. LaForte. Um, Mr. LaForte, first question, this question goes to you first. How would you assess the future of Plan Bay Area, given the numerous state and regional agencies now involved in administering various government-owned Bay Area lands? Well, I would assess that we, we really need to have a, a whole different approach to this. Uh, it needs to be more holistic, and it needs to uh, really get the agencies and separate uh, governmental groups, uh, cities and counties to work together better. Uh, than they have that's clear uh, we're still it's still amazing that when you go to other countries the bay area which prides itself on being this uh, incredibly environmentally conscious area is one of the most balkanized uh and and and, and disparate uh in terms of its um uh, the uh, the governmental authorities having control over something i mean other countries have in areas the size of us have a single transportation agency that runs everything we have multiple agencies that you know, they can't even work together sometimes. And so that really needs to be done. There needs to be a whole new approach. We have to rethink, given what's happened with climate change, particularly the, the last two years of the massive fires we've seen. Thank you. Ms. Eccles. Yeah, I, I think it's incredibly important to have a, a holistic approach to planning and to make sure that the cities, counties, park districts, everybody is working together towards the same goal uh you know climate change it's it's enormous and we're not going to be able to uh, address it one agency at a time so clearly you know fires sea level change um all of it crosses all boundaries and all borders and we need uh, a collaborative um well really worldwide approach but but we can start right here at home with the bay area Thank you. Um, Ms. Eccles, uh, long question. Elected officials and administrators have observed that the East Bay Regional Governments 
suffer from an inability to involve local governments in the governance and support of regional programs enjoyed by citizens of local governments. Do you agree with this assessment? And if so, how would you address it as it concerns the East Bay Regional Park? Wait, could you, could, could you repeat? Yeah, I'll read it again. <laughs> Elected officials and administrators have observed that the East, East Bay Regional Governments suffer from an inability to involve local governments in the governance and support of regional programs. It's about regional programs. So whether or not local governments become involved uh, successfully in regional programs, enjoyed by the citizens of all local governments. If you agree that that's a challenge, how would you address it as it concerns the East Bay Regional Park? Yeah, so it, I, I think it's, it's always important to, for all of the different stakeholders to be heard. So if, if there is a concern that, that local governments are not being heard at the park district, then we need to do something about it. And, and I personally have been very um, aggressive in my outreach to, to various, to the cities and officials throughout this region to hear them, to listen to the communities, to listen to both the community leaders and individual groups and nonprofits um, to understand what is it that you need from the park district and how can we better serve you and and that that is the promise that i have going forward that you know, whether you're in local government or whether you're you know the the person on the trail you know i want to hear from you i want to know how we can do better and and um, meet the needs of your community Thank you. And Mr. LaForte. Well, this ties back to what I said earlier about having a regional approach, for example, to dealing with uh, vegetation management and fire risk. Uh, that's very critical. Uh, and for those types of uh, issues where the park district is really one of the key agencies, I think the park district really needs to take a more proactive approach with more initiative on these, on these issues. It's clear to me, having served on a, on a city council for two terms, that there is a problem in how to deal with uh, between the regional uh, agencies and in localities like cities and even counties in dealing with regional issues. And this goes back to the fact, as I said before, that uh, there needs to be a whole new approach to how we deal with government in the Bay Area. This is a very balkanized uh, area of the country and it, it really needs to have a, 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 a better approach to how we deal with these things because Little localities like El Cerrito, they don't have the kind of money to deal with vegetation management um, and, other, and other risks. Oakland's even found that out. So we need, we need a better approach. Thank you. So now we've reached the last question. Um, and this is a different style. You can give me a one, it's got two parts and give me one word to each part. And the first part is a little different for each of you for our, our incumbent, uh, Director Eccles. Uh, the first part of the question is, how many board meetings have you missed in the last year? Um, I missed one board meeting when I was sick with COVID symptoms and we hadn't yet done the distance, the distance, uh, whatever. So it was pretty clear that I should stay home and follow the, the guidance. And so I did. And at that point, okay. we didn't even have phone connection. So yeah, I missed that one meeting. Second part of the question is, how frequently do you visit the East Bay Regional Park District Ward 1? Well, about every day. Um, I, I walk in the parks uh, in, in Tilden and out at Point Pinole is my favorite park. Um, I, I take my daughter down to the shoreline. She, she loves to jump in the bay, even, even in cold weather. So we're down there at, at Albany Beach. We're down there uh, all across the, well, really all of the uh, East Shore McLaughlin parks. Um, it's, it, well, anyway, yes, we, we're there a lot. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. And now Mr. LaForte, question for you is, how many board meetings have you attended in their entirety in the last year? Gonna unmute Mr. LaForte. I've attended about 12 to 15 board meetings but I've also attended, there's also committee meetings. I've attended probably about 12 to 15 of those. I'm also uh, on the trails workshop. So I've attended those meetings. We've had 
uh, one meeting of that. We're going to have many more. Uh, there's also the environmental roundtable that I help create where the environmental community can talk with the park district. That meets uh, about four to five times a year. I've attended each of those. So I attend a lot of meetings. Uh, of okay. The and then how frequently do you visit East Bay Regional Park District Ward 1? Well, I would say probably about uh, every other day. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm not as diligent as Ms. Eccles in going every day. Uh, but I get out there, particularly I go down to the Albany uh, Trail and the Albany Beach area um, and enjoy that because uh, that's partially because of my work in Measure Double W and Measure CC and FF that we have those amenities down there. So it's a great to go down there and see how much people like to uh, go there and use those, those places and enjoy them. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now before the candidates give their closing statements, I have a few remarks on behalf of uh, LWVBAE. Thank you to the candidates for running for office and for your participation this evening. I also want to thank the audience for engaging in our democracy. For further information about upcoming forums, the candidates, pros and cons, and positions on ballot measures, please visit the LEADS website, lwvbae.org or votersedge.org slash CA. We invite you to join the league to help us engage voters and defend democracy. We do so much more than voter registration and education. Visit our website and social media accounts at LWVBAE. The deadline to register to vote is October 19th this year. You can register to vote online at the Secretary of State's website, sos.ca.gov. Remember to vote by mail or at the polls by Tuesday, November 3rd. And this year we are encouraging voters to vote as early as possible. Please see our website for more information about voting in this election. Now, the candidates will make their closing statements and we will reverse the order that we began with. And so that means that, what does that mean? I think it means that Ms. Eccles goes first. Each candidate will give a closing statement of one minute. Ms. Eccles, did you go first to begin with? I don't remember now. Uh, I think yes, it is. You go first. Did you? Okay. Mr. LaForce went first, I think. Yes? Yeah, I, I think so. We'll so. have to replay the tape, <laughs> but go ahead, Ms. Eccles. Okay, great. Since the time that I was appointed director by unanimous vote of the Board of Directors in January, I've worked hard to address difficult and at times controversial issues. I've helped lead the park district through the COVID-19 pandemic, keeping our parks open at a critical time while ensuring the safety of our employees and the public. My dedication and collaborative approach has earned me the respect of my colleagues on the board, our management and our staff, as well as community members who use the East Bay parks. I'm proud to have the support of all of my colleagues on the board, our employee union, AFSCME 2428, and the Democratic Party. I'm honored that my campaign has brought together elected leaders, environmentalists, and community members from across the district, including Congressman Mark DeSalney, State Superintendent Tony Thurman, State Senator Nancy Skinner, Assemblymember Buffy Wicks, and mayors and former mayors in every, every city in my district. I would be honored to have your vote. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you, Ms. Nichols and Mr. LaForte. Yeah, so first I'd like to say I uh, was sad to hear that Ms. Eccles had a problem with COVID, but I'm very glad that that was a, not, a, not a real bad problem and hopefully that stays that way. That's not anything anyone wants to wish on any, anybody. Um, I have to say that uh, I've actually done parks. I don't talk parks, I've done parks, I've created parks, I've created ball fields, I've created opportunities for disadvantaged youth in uh, the close to 40 years that I've worked on park issues and park district issues. Uh, parks are a fundamental feature of our environment and of the, and we're one of the original environmental features of the uh, Sierra Club and also of uh, the environmental movement, creating parks. Uh, I'm happy and glad that I'm endorsed by the Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters. I like to tell people I'm the real green deal because I've done it. I've made parks happen. I will make parks happen for you and I just invite everyone to go to my website, laforceofcourse.org, uh, uh, to get more. And I thank the League for doing this forum. Thank you. Thank you both. And everyone, please join me in a round of applause for our candidates. Thank you all for attending. 
and good night.